got the same expression on both sides, you can bring it over. So this is the bring it over method. Not to be confused with the bring it on method. Okay. <laughs> so the bring it over method, we bring it over to the other side. That's the bring it on method. Uh, that's when we get to some really hairy integrals. And, uh, So now, do we know what the sum of 1 over m to the 4th is when m is odd? Yeah. yeah, it's going to be pi to the 4th over 2 times 48. So this is pi to the 4th over 96. So the sum over all m of 1 over m to the 4th, and of course by all m I only mean m goes from 1, 2, 3, 4. I don't mean negative m's, I don't mean m equals 0. Is going to just be 16 fifteenths times pi to the fourth over 96. How many times does 16 go into 96? Six. Six. And so we just get pi to the fourth over 90. So we've actually proved a formula for the sum of 1 over m to the fourth. And I believe we can actually use the word proved. I think everything we needed, we've done have not assumed anything. Okay? Now I want to do the sum of 1 over n squared from this. Okay? I'm going to need to use something which I was willing to prove in this class, but I was told not to prove in this class. What is it? Dirichlet's theorem. So instead of studying the sum of f hat, so to the fourth, what should we study instead of the sum of f hat to the fourth? I'm sorry, so, so the sum of, if we study the sum of f hat squared, we got something to the fourth power. What should we study instead? f hat. So somehow we want to study f hat and not squares. Can anybody give me an expression that involves f hat but not f hat squared? And the hint is we're using Dirichlet's theorem. So what should we be looking at? Well, what does Dirichlet's theorem tell us? Dirichlet's, you know, what does Faye's theorem tell us? What does the Pythagorean theorem tell us? How far back do I need to go? <laughs> Okay. Alright, so okay, so okay, so now moving forward from Pythagoras, let's <laughs> leap for a couple millennia <laughs> to Fayer. Fayer told us the weighted Fourier series converges uniformly. Dirichlet tells us that the Fourier series converges at any point where the function is differentiable. At this function, where is the function one half minus absolute value of x differentiable? Everywhere except for zero. Everywhere except for zero. And I want to use it at zero. So I want to use it in a place where Dirichlet's theorem is not available. But how badly does this feel in being differentiable? By a constant. Not very. What do you mean by a constant? It's differential off by a constant. Okay, good. So here, the ratio of f of h minus f of zero over h this is less than equal to 1. <coughs> and really, that's all we need for Dirichlet's system. This is the Lipschitz of exponent 1 condition. I don't need the full strength of differentiability. I just need the fact that this quotient is bounded. And then you can run through the Dirichlet argument and the Dirichlet machinery. So you know, the proof of Dirichlet is in the notes. It gives us pointwise convergence. In the book, I'm technically saying for places where the derivative exists. But really, all we need is this quotient to be bounded. And then everything is fine. All right, so since this quotient is bounded, you know, s infinity of x, well, s infinity f of x is the sum, n goes from minus infinity to infinity, of f hat of n e n of x. Okay, and so now, s infinity f of 
zero is going to be the sum n goes from minus infinity to infinity of f hat of zero. So we're going to get one quarter plus the sum um, m is odd f hat of m, right? Because all the other evens are zero. And what does this equal? So what does this equal? A half. A half. It equals f of zero, which is just a half. So this is how we can get the sum of 1 over n squared, is instead of using possible, we use Dirichlet. And this is one of the great advantages or one of the great reasons why people care about Fourier series. They allow us to evaluate certain sums that we care about. In general, we don't have that many sums that we can do. We can do maybe arithmetic progressions, we can do geometric series, maybe we can do some of the powers, the sum of n, some of n squared, some of n cubed. This is adding more stuff to our arsenal. Maybe we can do the harmonic series, the sum of 1 over n. But you know, in general, this is allowing us to get a lot more. Alright, so now let's see what happens. So one half is one fourth plus now the sum over m odd. I have one over pi squared m squared, and I'm going to put in a two. Why am I putting in a two? I'm sorry. Yeah, so I'm, I'm initially going from minus infinity to infinity. The contribution at minus 5 is the same as the contribution of 5. So let's just do it. M is an odd positive number. Okay, well, 1 half minus 1 fourth is 1 fourth, divided by 2 is 1 eighth. So we get the sum M odd, 1 over M squared, is going to be pi squared over 8. <coughs> And now we play the exact same game as before. The sum over all m of 1 over m squared is the sum m even, 1 over m squared, plus the sum m odd, 1 over m squared. Oh, well, what's the sum of 1 over m squared when m is even? A fourth a fourth of the sum over all m. So we get the sum over all m of three fourths, one of m squared, is the sum m odd, one over m squared, and we know that that's just pi squared over eight. All right, so all we have to do is multiply pi squared over eight by four thirds, and we get the sum over all m of 1 over m squared is pi squared over 6. Okay. We've now rigorously proved this modulo the fact that we didn't go through the details in class of Dirichlet's theorem. Okay. This is a great application of Fourier series. It allows us to rigorously prove statements like this. I strongly urge you at some point in your life, if you want to say in math, look at Euler's writings. Not necessarily in the original Latin, unless you really have a desire to see what he wrote. Yeah, I, I'd go for the translated versions. And if you want, I have some copies of these in my office. He had arguments for these and other facts. His arguments were, for the most part, wrong, but they were essentially correct. They had great ideas. The mathematical rigor was not there. The notion of rigor, you know, a couple hundred years ago, is not the same notion as we have now. In a sense, it's perfectly fine not to be completely rigorous at first, to get a sense of the theory, to get a sense of what's going on. And then, when you see something like this, and it's working to 50 decimals, you can become pretty confident. But there are times when things hold for a while, and then later on there's a small fluctuation, there's a small other term that's missed for a while. So you do have to be careful. Okay, so this finishes what I want to do on possible and on evaluating series by using Fourier's
by using Fourier series. Any questions on this unit before we shift to the Fourier transform and Poisson summation? Okay. There's at least three different normalizations of the Fourier transform. Which one you're using depends on what you consider the most essential thing. Uh, how many different ones do you use in physics? Two. Only two? There's a third. There is another. Mathematica uses a different one than I want. It's, do you want the operator to be a unitary operator? Do you want there to be two pi's in certain formulas? It's, these are the issues that affect where you normalize things. Okay. So Fourier transform. So, I will let you choose. I'm pretty sure I know which one you will choose. I need to use a letter for the place I evaluate the Fourier transform. You can use the C, or you can use the letter Y. Let's go with Y. Let's go with Y. Okay. <laughs> so, we all are in favor of C. Is that actually C? Yes. I don't know. <laughs> no. X is that the right number of squiggles? X is that right? the curvature. X I, yes. It's totally off. I'll get the tech code. <laughs> yeah. ah. Now, let's <laughs> use the tech code. <laughs> okay. Have you seen this before? Is that a battery? <laughs> 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 Sorry. Okay. 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 I guess. Complex conjugate of chi divided by the complex conjugate of C divided by C. This no, I'm not making this up. This is, I think, the most painful symbol to process I think, in mathematics that has come up. We will use y as our variable. Okay, y has one. F hat of y will be the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of x e to the negative 2 pi i x y dx. So I'm integrating out x and I'm left with a function of y. So the question is, when you see this, what's the first thing you should ask? Does it converge? Does it converge? Does it exist? So can someone give me conditions on f so that this will exist? I could take f of, uh, continuous is not going to be nearly enough. Because we're getting from minus infinity to infinity. Let's see. Bounded? Bounded's not enough. What's the, what's, the easy, what's the easiest value of y to consider? <laughs> y equals zero. So if you take y equals zero, you're just yeah, yeah. eating the function f of x. So, so f integrable. So if f is in L1, <laughs> you're okay. <laughs> And that means the integral of the absolute value of f of x dx is finite. And the reason this is enough is the absolute value of the integral is at most the integral of the absolute value. So if my function f is integrable, which means the integral of its absolute value is finite, then I'm okay. And f hat of y exists. Alright, I'm going to say f decays like 1 plus eta, eta greater than 0, if f of x is less than or equal to some constant divided by x to the 1 plus eta for all absolute value of x big. What is that thing that you say? Eta. 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 Do you want to use deltas instead of etas? No, 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 how many of you know the Greek alphabet? Doesn't have to be in order. Alphabet. I've done every letter in late. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I've used them all in physics. Right. 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 Sometimes in the same equation. <laughs> you should know the Greek alphabet. Okay. It's an A. Okay. No, I mean if you don't know the Greek alphabet, so you know, watch Animal House, you know, to study the Greek alphabet. Okay. So that actually came up in probability today. Who can give me the motto of Faber College from Animal House? Never seen. Do I fail? All right. So, 
sorry? We should watch my class on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> if people can show up before 11 o'clock, absolutely. Alright, guys. <laughs> I gotta do this. Uh, I'll show we, my favorite scene from Animal House. Wake up early, week class early. You don't have to be awake for the scene. What does this mean in words? <laughs> can somebody tell me what does, what does this mean? F of x less than equal to constant x to the 1 plus eta. to zero? How fast? Pretty, well, it depends on eta, right? Like faster or than x. I'm sorry? Faster than faster one over x. Faster than one over x. Yeah. So it goes to zero by a power faster than one over x. Okay? So what function is a difficult function to integrate from, say, one to infinity? One over x. One over x. <laughs> what about a function like this? <laughs> Or it won't be zero, but I mean, it's at least integrable. That little bit of extra decay is enough to make sure that my integrals exist. Really? Yes, really. That's why we're doing this, okay? <laughs> I need just a little bit of extra decay. I've told my probability students to just keep their engineering hats on until I say otherwise for the rest of the semester. Oh, I see. But, you know, here in this class, we're actually talking about this. 300 level post core classes are really the hardest classes we have at Williams. They are harder than the 400 level classes. This is really a graduate class right now, which is why I've cut back on the homework. There are advantages to taking a graduate class. Okay. <laughs> we, we have to deal with rigor. We have to deal with convergence issues. And if I want things to converge, I need sufficient decay. So Poisson summation, this is one of the greatest formulas in mathematics. So let's say f, f prime, F double prime decay like one plus eta for an eta greater than zero. Then the sum over all n, say minus infinity to infinity of f of n, is the sum n goes from minus infinity to infinity of f hat of n. So I'm going to give you guys a history question. What were we doing before we launched into this whole digression on Fourier analysis? <coughs> I'm sorry? Uh, do you remember what we did right before we did this? And I said, we need to do this because we need a formula for something. Riemann zeta. Function. Riemann zeta function. Yeah, right. I knew it. <laughs> yeah. Something I mean, with Riemann or Toshi. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say, I'm not going to do an M&M because, you know, without... Lots of generality, you guess we want to coach you in this class. Well, I, for knowing that, I should get an MF. <laughs> oh, no, you're kidding me, man. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Why did I say we had to take this digression? What were we doing with the Riemann zeta function when we hit a wall? I'm sorry? The prime number theorem. We were trying to prove we needed to shift a contour. And we needed, well, if we're going to shift the contour, the function better exist. And so we needed to continue the function. We needed an analytic continuation. The Poisson summation formula will allow us an analytic continuation for all values of s. So we were able to go full circle and we'll be able to prove the Riemann zeta function has a continuation. And then from that, we'll be able to give a better sketch of the proof of the prime number theorem. Typically, if f slowly decays, f rapidly decays. Uh, <laughs> Alright, so obviously there's a typo. <laughs> what is the typo? Uh, yes, where does the hat go? Doesn't actually matter. <laughs> it's fine either way. Turns out, f hat hat is of, of x is f of negative x, if you do the calculation. So if f is even, f hat hat is f hat. Hat, which is f. <laughs> okay? If you, do, if you take the Fourier transform twice, you return to where you start, except x is replaced with negative x. If you do it four times, you return to where you start. It sounds like something. Okay? Sounds like a group. Yeah. 
Would it be useful for me to look at the sum of f hat hat? It would be the same as this. Yeah, because replace n with negative n. So really, there's no point in looking at trying to involve f hat hat. One of the most powerful techniques in a lot of analytic number theory is to apply Poisson summation twice. Now, if you apply Poisson summation, replace the sum of f with the sum of f hat, and then apply it again, what happens? Sum of f hat hat. Which means you return to where you started. So if you apply Poisson summation twice, you've done nothing. The trick is, and it's very hard to do this well, one of my advisors is a master at this. If you apply Poisson summation once, then do some analysis. Simplify things, throw away some errors, and then apply Poisson summation again, it's no longer trivial. And you can actually pull stuff out from this. Uh, this is uh, Professor Henrik Ivanjic at Rutgers. He's phenomenal in terms of how he's able to milk you know, convergence from issues like this. We will only be using Poisson summation once, but for us that would be more than enough to get some good results. Okay, so why is it useful? If you have a function that's very slowly decaying, you have to have a lot of terms in the sum before you really understand its value. If you have a function that's rapidly decaying, you often only need one term, the n equals zero term. This is very big in probability. In a lot of the work I and my students do in Benefit's Law, we use Poisson summation. We only need what's going on at n equals zero. Did he violate your personal space? Okay. What? <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to be allowed to sit in the front row again. Oh, come on. <laughs> okay. So, we want to study the sum. Can anybody give me an idea of a good function to look at that's going to be related to f? Is he going to yell at you for that? <laughs> I'm not going to toss you down and you can come up and get that, but we're not doing any contour integrals. If you've read the notes, this might be a little easier. What's a good function? We somehow want to get sums over all integers. But I need some x dependence, and maybe somehow I evaluate something at a very special choice of x. So what would be a good sum to look at where for a special value of x, it would reduce to this? What do you think that value of x would be? Zero. zero. So can you somehow generalize this and make this depend on x, so that when x equals zero... I'm sorry? So when the x equals to identity... The summation and it goes from minus infinity to infinity. F of x plus n. So basically, take your function at x and look at all <laughs> shapes. <laughs> Come on. It's so boring. It's so boring? It's so trivial. Yeah. <laughs> but x equals zero, you just look at the image. Okay. Well, if you guys read a little bit more in your book, I wouldn't have to do the trivial stuff and we could go to the highest stuff. So. <laughs> Okay. This is not trivial. This is a great observation. This is basically taking a function and looking at special movements of it. We're basically evaluating it at all translations by one unit. What can you tell me about the function big F? It decays like We don't know that yet. I mean, that's a little bit of work to get. A little bit of work to get that. What values of x do I really need to understand to understand this function? Give me a value where I want to evaluate this. Zero. zero. Give me another value. What's the difference between the value of this at zero and the value of this at one? Nothing really important. If I replace x with with x plus 1, hmm. I can take the 1 and fold it into the n. Yeah. I'm sorry? It's the same as before. This is a periodic function. I only need to study it for x between 0 and 1, or x between minus a half and a half. So, only care if 0 less than equal to x less than equal to 1. 
Now we're in the realm of Fourier series. I have a periodic function. It would be really nice if this function had additional properties such as continuity or even more general existence. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, why do I need to impose these decay conditions? I need to impose these decay conditions so that f exists. So imagine, I've talked to some of you about this example. Let's say g of x is such that the integral of g of x to the k dx from 0 to infinity is less than infinity if k is less than equal to 2012, but infinity if k equals 2013, and we'll assume g of x is greater than or equal to 0. Does a function like this exist? The integral of g is finite, the integral of g squared is finite, the integral of g cubed is finite, the integral of g to the 2012 is finite, but the integral of g to the 2013 blows up. Yes, it exists. Okay. Yes. That was like 50 50. <laughs> <laughs> I just, you guess 2013 on that. That's for that. <laughs> uh, but then that, that would eat up the whole class. <laughs> Do we need to get through all those MMs by the end of the class? We don't need to. I mean, I'm teaching more classes in the future. So, when you look at a function and you're told the function integrates to a finite number, what do you think is happening as you go off to infinity? It's going to zero. It's going to zero. But not necessarily. It just has to be going to zero most of the time. It could have spikes. I'm not going to bother doing a continuous example. Here's n. I'm really going to blow things up. n, the 1 over 2n to the delta, and minus 1 over n, uh, 2n to the delta. And I'm going to assume the value of my function is n. And then it's 0 here and 0 here. So near each integer n, it spikes up to n, but over a very short interval. So the further down I go, the smaller and the smaller and the smaller the interval is. Is my function going to zero for most values of x? Yes. But there's a sequence of x where it's tending to infinity at the integers. Mm -hmm. And if I wanted to evaluate the integral, the integral of, you know, to the kth would be basically the sum of n to the k over n to the delta. And that's why I put the factors of 2 here, so that the width is exactly 1 over n to the delta. What values of k will this converge for? Well, this is the same as the sum of n to the k minus delta. I need k minus delta to be smaller than negative 1. So if I take delta to be 2014, I will be fine for k up to 2012, but I won't be fine in 2013. Okay. And then the whole point of using the year is to show you that it doesn't matter. Right? You could do this any finite number of times. This is what makes analysis hard, is functions like this are allowed into the classroom. Okay. This is why I teach complex analysis. Sadly, here today, I have to worry about functions like this. Okay? The i in the exponential is not enough protection. This is why you have to be so careful. It is so easy to accidentally assume something. And to say, well, look, my function has to be decaying. It, it, it integrates to a finite number. How could it not be decaying? It can be spiking on smaller and smaller and smaller intervals. And so here... I can arrange it so that a huge number of powers are all fine, but a later power blows up. You should always try to find counterexamples, strange functions, strange examples. This is how you really test the bounds of what's going on in analysis. It's from stuff like this that you really learn what's going on. So now, f, f prime, f double prime, decay like 1 plus beta. Big f of x is the sum, and it goes from minus infinity to infinity, f of x plus n. So the first thing we get is that it exists.
And the reason it exists is now we have enough decay. So that this is decaying like 1 over you know, x plus n to the 1 plus eta. There's enough decay here so that when I sum, the sum will converge. And the next thing is, what do you think f prime of x is? Shame that the physicists you know, let you get that in before they chimed in. Why is that true? The sum is finite, so we can switch the order. That's too much, that's too much physics, even from me. <laughs> okay, if you multiply by i, i is a rotation by 90 degrees, and yes, i times infinity is bounded by 10. <laughs> yes? I can't even say that. You get it, right? Yes. There is to be e to be... No, why is i times infinity if i is rotation by 90 degrees bounded by 10? Because it's 8. Because it's 8. <laughs> oh. I can't. Oh. <laughs> it's not a finite sum. You cannot give me finite sum as an explanation. <laughs> That was really advanced with this stuff. That's like gradual level. Yeah, that's, grad that's okay. <laughs> but this is a 300 level course. I can't use finiteness because I don't have finiteness. Why can I say the, the sum of the derivative is the derivative of the sums? Sum is finite. Sorry? <laughs> no, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, let's go back to the... Remote his math major. He has a backup. He's not that sounds fine, but like... In vain his personal space all the all you want. God, stay <laughs> on. The sum is fine, man. The sum is fine? Because f exists, so that sum exists. The sum is not the big F. The definition of the sum is fine. Yeah. Okay, there we go. why is... <laughs> That's not quite enough. No. Oh. Does this remind you of any theorems you've seen? Yes. No. I thought it was because it was periodic, like you can take like one to the segment, and then it would be it would repeat over and over. But the problem is I've defined big F in terms of an infinite sum. Well the only no like it's in the right Yes. It sums equal to its derivative. Yes. Didn't we do that proof in class? Yeah, we did that like months ago. Right. That was like three years ago. Yes. <laughs> you know, you know, there's another reason why we're doing this now. I don't have to go through all the discussion that I do in the chapter. You've seen the theorem from complex analysis. If you have a series that converges, uh, you can differentiate term by term within its uh, you know, radius convergence. of convergence. So the question is, can you somehow justify that to this? in terms of how I have my series. Well, I have decay, you can basically modify the arguments. So the decay allows us to differentiate term by term. To prove certain things exist, I think I actually need f double prime at some point, but I'm assuming f double prime is also decaying sufficiently fine so that I'm okay. So I can differentiate term by term. What? Yep. <laughs> I remember stuff from three years ago. Did yeah, no, no. <laughs> you just allocate yourself with that? Yep. Yes. It's a Yes. This is why you waited for me to send all the letters of recommendation. Well, you have a few more it's letters of recommendation. Okay. <laughs> pa 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 pass the M&Ms around. Just pass them. Keep them away from Philly. Oh. Okay, play keep away. <laughs> all right, so now we know that big F exists. Big F prime exists. Whose theorem could we use? <laughs> Whose theorem can we use? Big F Bayer? has a derivative that exists. Dirichlet. Dirichlet, thank you. Oh. Why can we use Dirichlet's theorem? Because it's differentiable. Good. Can I use <laughs> Dirichlet's theorem? Right? So one of the nice things about knowing that F prime exists is now Dirichlet's theorem is accessible. Okay, so we're in great shape now. We have big F exists, that's always nice. It's differentiable. We know a formula for its derivative. And so now, what is big F of zero? 
Well, that's going to be just the sum, and goes from minus infinity to infinity of f of n. That's half of what we want. All we have to do now is figure out what the sum of f hat of n is. What is, give me another formula for f of 0. Yes! <laughs> no. Is it like negative two halves? Of it. I'm sorry? Two halves. No. Four halves. <laughs> <laughs> I hit 16. My words come twice. Well, four halves works. Two halves. If you say it out loud, you're correct, but you have to give me more detail to write it. Uh, isn't it f hat of double hat? Be more specific. Out of n plus zero? No. <laughs> what? Is it, is it negative? Or what? A little left. So here's a Look, big f. Small f. <clears throat> big, big, no. big f. Yes. <laughs> what? What? No. I don't know for that. Why is it big f? This is by definition a big f. Why is this true? I have to, so I can justify my later commitment. Uh, Dirichlet. Dirichlet, right? So this is the easy one. We've defined big F as the following. Putting in x equals 0, we get that sum. Okay, that's not so bad. That's the definition of big F. The second one, that has meat. That has content. That's Dirichlet's thing. Okay? So from Dirichlet's theorem, now we know big F of zero is this. So to prove Poisson, what do we need to do? We have to show little f hat is the same as big F hat at n. Okay? So big F hat of n is the integral from minus, I'm sorry, from zero to one of big F of x e to the negative 2 pi n x dx. Right? Is there no i there? Oh, sorry, there's an i. Right? Now, this is the integral from 0 to 1. I have the sum I'm already using the letter n here, so I'll use the letter m. m goes from minus infinity to infinity of f of x plus m e to the negative 2 pi i n x dx. Now which, yes? Can you, can you? Yes, we can. Because it's on the spine <laughs> <laughs> What's your excuse? <laughs> He's a closet physicist. He's coming out <laughs> secretly. Secretly. That's how I knew the other thing was graduate physics because I know <laughs> Why can't I switch them? <laughs> decay. Decays. So this is where I use the fact that I have plenty of decay. Right? Because these are decaying like 1 over 1 uh, x to the 1 plus eta, I have enough decay. I can put in absolute values. If the integral of the sum of the absolute values is finite, <coughs> I can switch orders. Whose theorem is that? Kubini. Yes. Thank you for saying it before. Somebody could say Riemann. It's <laughs> 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 the Kubini theorem. Who's what? Who's what's that? Oh, I didn't say anything. No, I, I said before. No, Fubini. Fubini's theorem. Fubini's theorem. Fubini. So Fubini or the fubini tonelli theorem, if the double integral or the integral sum of the absolute value is finite, you can switch orders. I, when I switch orders, what do I get? Sum of the sum n goes from minus infinity to infinity, integral from 0 to 1, f of x plus m, e to the negative 2 pi i n x dx. What happens, you know, some assembly required, what happens when you put it together? Get. Don't, don't, don't jump too many steps. 
We still have, I think, like three minutes. Oh, nope, we don't. Oh, we have <laughs> that clock has been moved back. When I integrate from 0 to 1 and then m goes from minus infinity to infinity, this cub is the interval from negative infinity to infinity. I just piece them all together. This is the same as the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of x e to the negative 2 pi i n x dx. And what does that equal? Little f hat. So here, this is denoted the Fourier transform, not the Fourier coefficient at n. And that finishes the proof of this one. Alright? We got it with, I think, half a minute to spare. Okay? I did not want to get into another unit today. I wanted to make sure we finished Poisson, but did not really want to start anything else. So this is perfectly timed. Okay? Like, so what could be uh, next week material? So next week we're going to do quantum mechanics on Monday, and we'll do the uncertainty principle, so I think. We, will this some be fine next week? <laughs> 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 and then we will also do the analytic continuation of the Riemann zeta function. And then after that, I want to start talking to you guys about you know some of the topics you want to see. I definitely want to do the method of stationary.